Hi, I'm Jack Madden, and I'm teaching at the Rhode Island School of Design. And I'll be giving a talk on mastering fine arts with Mathematica and using code as a creative artistic medium. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Madden. Uh, I have a PhD in astrophysics from Cornell and also an MFA uh, from the Rhode Island School of Design uh, in digital plus media. And I've used Mathematica in both. Uh, so I'll kind of go through uh, my journey from science to art and then back to Mathematica. Uh, and then I'll show some of my own students' work as I've taught how to use Mathematica at an art school. So you're probably all wondering, and maybe you saw the title of this talk and were like, I just need to know like why he went from astrophysics to art. <laughs> um, so yeah. The, the differences between astrophysics and art, um, I've kind of noticed there's a lot of overlap. It's this kind of pure science and then art, you're kind of really thinking about um, our understanding. Uh, but how does kind of Mathematica come into all of this? The overlap between these three is really, really tiny. Um, so you know, what am I doing here? Um, you know, it's, it's maybe a really lonely space. I'm, I'm trying to find more people who are, who are doing this. Um, I have found one other person because uh, I've, I've posted on community and found someone else who, who used my code and was doing astrophysics, art, and Mathematica. So there's one other person. Um, so we kind of need to start with this divide that I think exists between how people think about um, you know, STEM and the sciences, because that's my background in science. So I'll be kind of focusing on science a bit and this a uh, more intuitive artistic side. And I think that this is, is really a myth, that there is this divide between you know, intuitive and analytical or left brain, right brain. Uh, great mathematicians are highly creative people. Um, artists, if you see their work it's, you know, and their practice, it's really quite rigorous. So I think this divide you know, doesn't really exist. Um, you know, art and science are not opposites, or even two sides of the same coin. Uh, Mae Jameson puts it really nicely. I saw a talk from her um, many years back, but she says that the sciences provide an understanding of a universal experience, and the arts provide a universal understanding of a personal experience. Okay, so so this relationship I think runs really deep. This you know, relationship between art and science, um, it really comes back to just that the sciences are innately human. You can't escape it. You know, you're trying to um, remove all the human bias, but it is really this innately human experience um, through the communication, the sharing, the inspiration that art can provide. So as a scientist kind of thinking about this. And my research uh, at Cornell was in the search for life and, and modeling exoplanet atmospheres. It's using Mathematica to do that. But I was thinking about kind of how we communicate our work and our research uh, and the responsibility that comes with it. So we're coming up on this time where we might actually have you know, the first detections of life or the signs of life on another planet. Uh, but we get headlines like this um, that I wish were true, but are not. Um, where there's just a lot of miscommunication, the, the translation of the scientists who have, you know, have, they have all the cards in front of them, they're the best uh, you know, at understanding the full concept, but they just, there's a translation error that happens uh, when it gets out into the public. And so how can we kind of facilitate that, kind of either teach artists uh, a bit more science or scientists a bit more about this art and communication uh, to kind of make this whole um, endeavor a bit healthier, uh, a bit more accurate, and hopefully when we do get a detection of life, um, that people are either really interested in a pot like this or actually have some art to go and accompany it. So this is what you might see uh, if there was a detection of life. Um, and it's not, you know, this isn't going to be like a paradigm shifting image of our modern culture this image. It's just not, graphs don't do that. Um, but what does do that is something like this. There's the pale blue dot image. 
Now, this is what you get when you have a scientist on the team who's thinking artistically, right? So Carl Sagan, who decided that this was a worthwhile shot to take, has resonated through you know, the sciences and art and just cu culture in general to kind of capture um, you know, the endeavor of the mission itself and our place in the universe. So how do we kind of find something a bit deeper uh, here to make something you know, effective like this? So to many scientists, uh, you're kind of thinking of art as like the poster, or maybe if you're lucky, you have some concept art, uh, maybe just some graphic design. Um, but I think you know, there's something a bit deeper that we can access here. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking about wanting to do this, but I don't have any training. So it's like, I should go to art school to, to actually figure out how this is done. You know, I shouldn't be so naive to think that I can figure this out without actually getting trained to do it. Uh, so I go to RISD and it turns out that art is no longer about these kind of traditional mediums, painting, sculpture, um, illustration, that's all taught at RISD, but there's a whole kind of critical mass of artists that are using code as the medium for creation. So think of paint, like you'd paint to capture a landscape, you can actually use code as the artistic medium to capture something about um, you know, big data, AI, automation, social media, privacy, surveillance, all of these kind of code-based aspects of our society today kind of rely on a, a new medium to be explored. So I'll kind of go through a few examples of this, uh, of using code as the artistic medium. So here is a work at a huge scale. These are people down at the bottom um, using data from CERN. So this was a, at a residency at um, the particle accelerator, just kind of showing the massive amounts of data that are being handled on this huge scale, but you know, exploring this world that's really, really tiny. You can kind of see these graphs like spinning by. Libby Heaney is actually using time on IBM's quantum computers to create assets for virtual worlds. So she's writing code uh, to be used on quantum computers and getting some like strange results that you couldn't typically get uh, through normal operations on a traditional programming language. So really interesting results there too. This might be a little hard to read with the lights, but this is code that is, you know, essentially it's a, it's a poem that you can run. Um, and by running the, the poem here, uh, it might be hard to see, but there's like raindrops that are uh, you know, shown in an animation through running this poem. Uh, Matthew Rayfield is a great example of uh, kind of this really playful aspect of code, just reminding us that coding can be really fun. Uh, so there's this website he created, and if you you know, use the developer menu to inspect this snake element. You can actually play the game snake inside of the inspect of the, <laughs> the web browser. So just like really fun magic. Um, that's, that's, that's just, just fun. Um, a whole lot of other stuff on his website too. Uh, please check it out. So I realized that I don't need to like learn a whole new medium to make art that I want to make. I can use Mathematica. Um, so I learn about you know how to make a rigorous art practice and do the research and you know I'm reading papers, I'm running little experiments, kind of a lot of the stuff I was doing as a scientist, but you know with these whole new questions about you know understanding and our relationship with science. Um, and kind of humans and how we discover things. So that's kind of the topics I was doing. So here's just a few examples of some of the work I was doing um, with Mathematica's help. And I wanna kind of stick on this one as, as an example. Let's go to the next slide, there we go. So this is a work um, where essentially you're asking the question, what would the complete definition of a word look like? 
Uh, so if you take a word and you define it, and then you define all of the words in that definition, and then all the words in those definitions, and you're connecting them back to each other, so you're keeping track of which ones are uh, coming from which, and you do that until you kind of run out of new words to add. So if you take a second, you'll realize that you're going to, it's like, you know, finite set, right? There's a limited number of words. Uh, you're going to, you know, self-reference a lot. So it's kind of creates this closed system. I'm going to show that uh, on a small scale, what that looks like. So you're starting with the word meaning. The definition is the implied or explicit significance. And then you go and you define implied, um, the suggested but not directly expressed. Uh, comma, there's comma in there, and then implicit, you keep going. And then you can see here when you get to explicit, it references back to or, because that's in the definition. So eventually you're gonna get all these references back to other words that you've already found. And you can see how if I keep adding words, you know, we're gonna start filling this in. And, and when you get to 8,000 words that you need to do this, um, it stops becoming like a, a useful data visualization and really kind of captures this feeling about how closed and recursive uh, a dictionary might be. So these are super highly detailed. There's about 80,000 lines in here. And this was all done uh, in Mathematica, posted on community as well. Um, you can run different starting words, see the differences, or you can actually do like different embedding algorithms. So I, I finished my PhD, uh, or I finished my PhD, finished the MFA, um, and now I had this opportunity to start teaching um, at the Rhode Island School of Design. And there's a lot of programs that are specifically de designed for artists who are interested in coding. Um, so if you've heard of processing or P5, these are kind of artist-directed uh, coding languages written in um, for Java and uh, JavaScript. And this is what's typically taught uh, if a student was interested in coding. And I saw, you know, I was exposed to these, I learned how to use them, uh, but I saw some advantages uh, and disadvantages of using Mathematica uh, for, you know, creativity, for artistic coding. Um, so I had the opportunity to teach my own students how to use Mathematica this semester. And so I'll show a few examples of um, what they've done and realize they've only had their freshman uh, art and design students. So they're in you know, a wide variety of different uh, interests and they've only had maybe a few weeks to get a handle on this. So the first two I'll show are after one day of learning Mathematica and then the rest are after um, two days of learning Mathematica. Um, so there's always a student who tries to like break the code as much as possible. So Sage tried to as hard as he could to kind of crash the code, um, but had some of these nice uh, outputs. Um, so realize these students have never touched a programming language before. Uh, and this, these two are after just one day of doing it. The student had fun with like random squiggles, And then on the, the second week, um, the second day we met, um, a group of students was interested in using Mathematica to recreate patterns that they found in nature. So we have this great resource at RISD called the Nature Lab. So we went there and students started to recreate what they were seeing in Mathematica. So here's a 3D uh, object of a radiolaria, which is a little uh, zooplankton. Um, the students saw these, uh, patterns in fungus and created this uh, kind of really nice gradient Bernoulli pattern, I guess. These are butterfly scales and then recreated in, as this like procedural map of that very pixelated. And this student had a lot of fun with creating, generating spirals and spiral graphs from an image of this, this shell here. Uh, and this other student, Jonathan, has gotten really interested in actually making, uh, using Mathematica to make um, like clothing templates 
that are really low waste. So how do you take an object like this? So this is like, this might be part of a shirt or something, break it up into uh, smaller objects. So break it up into triangles. And then how do you pack those triangles into a rectangle to have very little waste um, in the manufacturing of this type of clothing? So those are just some examples. Um, and I hope I have some time for questions because I wanted to get your feedback on all of this. Uh, so I'll kind of end it there. And uh, there is also a break after this if you want to come up and chat. Um, but thank you. There we go. Good amount of time for questions. Yeah. What do you what do you mean by this a scientific? Um, I think the art, you know, coming back to something like this, having an artist approach a topic and learn about it really reveals some new ways to think about what you're you're looking at or the data that you have. And I saw this a lot in my PhD when I would, um, I'd be making like concept art for our research. So the exoplanet around the star. Um, and I'd come up into our, our research groups and I'd ask questions about the decisions I had to make as an artist to recreate what the research was. And I'd be asking questions that they had never thought of before. And so I'm like, yo, what is, what is actually the, gonna be the color of the ocean on this planet? Like, oh, well, that's actually an interesting question. Um, you know, the light's going to be different. It's around a different type of star. Um, if the atmosphere is a little different, the actual ocean color is coming from that. So it's actually going to be totally different. So it was a way to explore the science in new ways. And if you're making something like this, that's a visual that's beyond what you would put in a paper, like you, you couldn't this isn't a useful way to explore the data, but it shows you some really interesting trends kind of all at once. So if you were to share this, um, you'd kind of capture um, maybe a little bit of that intuitive understanding that takes a while to get um, just looking at you know detailed uh, snapshots of this. Um, you know, it's not trying to make scientific discoveries. It's trying to kind of um, widen what it is to do science. Um, yeah, that answers the question. Yeah. Um, the definition of art is something we're going to do in a half hour. Right. It's, it's not, there isn't a line. And I, I took out a bunch of slides that I was going to show kind of exploring that, like where is the line between it? Um, and it was really hard because uh, take, for example, like the James Webb imagery. They, it's coming from real data. It's processed, calibrated. Um, but then there's a step where it, it starts to get a little subjective and how they show what it is. So the false color is useful for scientists to show the different elements in an image. But you're, you're, you might be doing it in a way that looks good to you, that looks beautiful. Yeah. And so you're kind of blending like what is useful to the scientists and what is actually like good to look at. Um, and then on top of that, it's like, okay, maybe if it's good to look at, then it's clearly not scientific. Um, but when you're a designer and you're deciding how to uh, share information, it's really important for it to be like shared effectively. And a lot of those decisions that get made about making something easier to understand have to do with the way it looks and like if it's uh, engaging at a certain level. So, 
you know, I think if you teach scientists about art and it's like art practice, you know, they're going to maybe get a, a more holistic view of kind of what it means to be a human that's doing science. Um, but they're also going to pick up on these, these practical skills of um, presentation, graphs, and things like that. So it's, it's kind of hard to, to draw a line between art and science uh, in, those, in those sorts of areas. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I had, it's a studio class, so it's, it's several hours long, but I kind of showed them, you know, how to use Mathematica that first day and gave them some time to, you know, in the class to work on stuff. And then the following week was like when the assignment was due. Um, so I am using a lot of examples, uh, from like the demonstration site, um, the neat examples and all the documentation is really helpful. Um, so they're looking at those and they're you know, iterating upon them. I, I didn't want them to just like copy and paste stuff. Um, but it was hard to find, you know, there's no course on like Mathematica for an artist. Um, it's, it's really like just understand the basics then kind of see uh, what you can do with it. So I kind of, the initial day was really interesting. It's kind of just me showing all of these, like, it's like a magic show, right? Just showing all these fun things that Mathematica can do um, to get them interested. Um, yeah, that's about it. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that I do was digital. So this is this is actually an image of a panel, and it was I used Mathematica to help me make these laser cut laser cut images to cut into the panel. Um, I'm forgetting his name, but there's someone who uh, 3D prints a lot of these like geometric shapes. I don't know if anyone knows who I'm talking about um, using Mathematica. So they're you know exporting um, you know these 3D graphics uh, for printing. So yeah, you can kind of go anywhere with it, or you can even just use it as, you know, a set of references that you're then, you know, painting something with. I think that's already happening. Um, the thing that I'm not concerned about is like if I think it's it's maybe a good it's healthy for um, the whole art community, but um, kind of differentiating. The different types of art. Art is super broad. Artist is an extremely broad term. Uh, so uh, there's many artists I know that don't feel threatened by what is created by AI now. That if if you feel like your art can be made by an AI and have the same value, then like you're doing a certain type of art. And if you're you don't feel threatened, then that's like kind of a different type. Um, so I personally don't feel threatened by it, but um, you know, there's a lot of artists who are, and I think that that is something that we should really think about. Um, you know, how they find uh, meaningful jobs if um, a news website can just kind of type in a word and get you know an image that they use in an article where they used to have you know supported someone financially. Um, yeah, it's tough and changing like every day. So there's probably a news article today about that exact topic. Yeah. I have tried Dolly too. Yeah. And and there I kind of learned that, you know, I don't I kind of developed that relationship that like my work doesn't feel threatened by it. Um if you really pay attention to how it's making the images too, um it's not perfect. Like it, it will get there eventually, but right now it's not. And you can really tell, uh, I think, the difference between something that is AI generated and something that's not. If you just glance at it, you really can't. But um, upon closer inspection, you can really tell. So if you're all interested, if you are interested enough to come to this talk, you should really check out the uh, visual arts um, group on the community forums. Um, there's a lot of stuff. It's a small community, but. You know, it's very active, so I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
It's hard to answer. I mean, this is so this is the first time I'm kind of teaching Mathematica to, to art students. Um, and every day after class, I'm like rewriting how I would do the lesson. <laughs> um, and just hearing kind of new voices and a topic that I know so well as a scientist um, has been really eye opening. Um, and hopefully I get to develop it further. So this winter, I'm going to be teaching kind of a more focused uh, like art computation course. And I'll be using Mathematica. Um, so hopefully after a couple iterations, we'll get more refined. But um, I'd love to talk more about that with you.